we've got a very exciting presenter tonight. She comes to us highly recommended. Um, she's going to be talking to us about textured soft slab building with tar paper. And when I saw her work, my comment to her was torn apart and put back together again. So this is, this is like, um, I think it's going to be fun. It's going to push your creativity. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Elaine Pinkernell to you. Um, she is our presenter tonight. She's going to do a little bit of an intro. We're going to watch a video that she's put together for us. And then after the video, we'll do questions and answers. So use the chat button to front load your questions in case stuff comes up during the presentation. So Elaine, it's all yours until you tell me to run the video. <laughs> well, hello, hello. It's lovely to see all of you after this time of being so stuck in our own spaces. And it's also lovely to hear all these mentions of Ventura and Santa Barbara, because I grew up in, Cal in Carpinteria. Um, a long, long time ago, and it's uh, still filled with wonderful, wonderful memories. Uh, and I return there every year to spend time there. Um, I've, I've been thinking about, you all read, I don't know if you've all read, but um, I, you know, my bio, but something I've been thinking about is just, you know, what's happening currently because uh, everything has changed. And, the, the, the thing with me is there's been periods of feeling like, well, there's nothing left to make. Sorry, the sun's going down in my studio, so you're going to see me <laughs> slowly get sunny. And I don't know if you, you all ever get to that point where you feel like, I can't think of anything new. And, and it's happened a time or two. At one point, I honestly felt like I don't have anything else to make. <laughs> and so I told everybody I'm not going to be a potter anymore and I went and did customer service and sold telescopes for quite a while and that was incredibly fun um it was kind of a nice relief but then you know the, the urge came back and so there's just this time of flux that I just keep thinking about of how can you always keep it fresh and for me, it's always been seeing other people make pots, seeing other people paint, seeing other people do something that brings them joy. And somehow that eventually, and I say eventually, strongly might spark something with me. I, I've always said I have an incredibly steep learning curve with everything that I've done. And um, I was a thrower. I learned to throw and, and decided that I would poof after being a programmer market dinnerware to make a living. Well, <laughs> I was a very slow thrower compared to most of the amazing throwers out there. But um, my, and, and during that time, I would always go off and take some sort of course that sounded interesting. And I forced myself to take a course in hand building that I'd never done before. It always sounded like an anathema to me. It wasn't round. So <laughs> how do I do that? So I went and took a, a slab building class and I came back from that and I said, I am never going to do this. It's so boring. It's so slow. And literally it took me two years of that sitting in the background for me to figure out, maybe I'll rip things up. And I started ripping things up because I make so many mistakes, you know? Um, so, you know, that's always been in the, the back of my head. My mistakes are generally the biggest um, indicators of what, where I need to go next. So there's that. Don't ignore something that feels super uncomfortable um, because it might just be your next direction. Hi, my name is Elaine Pinkernell. What I'm going to demonstrate for you today is a method of working with soft slabs, ripping them up and putting them right back together so it looks like a quilted design and uh, using tar paper templates 
as a means of creating the form. So this one is a simple rectangle. And this one, which I'm not going to demonstrate, but you can see how far you can take this is basically a cone. This makes a cone. The seam is back here and you can make it round, oval, whatever you like. So the trick there to creating a new template is seeing a shape or finding a shape and being able to make the, the, uh, the template flat. So you have to kind of unfold it with your eyes. Um, so let's start making this. Okay, what I've got here is a slab that I've rolled out about a quarter of an inch thick. It is right from the bag, so it is very flexible. And I've got my tar paper template. Some of you may not know what tar paper is. It is a waterproof, flexible, sort of thick paper that is put on a roof underneath the shingles. So it, it makes the perfect, uh, somewhat stiff, but waterproof template. If you, where do you get this? At the hardware store in a giant roll. Um, comes in 15 weight, 30 pound weight. If you do buy a roll of it, it will last you for a lifetime. So <laughs> it's always nice to share it with a friend. You want to get the 15 pound weight, not the 30 pound weight. Uh, 30 pound weight is too thick. It doesn't fold or bend readily. So here's my template. I put notations on it to remind myself to cut the clay a quarter inch bigger right here. So here's my slab. I like to get rid of the canvas texture on it first by using a very smooth rib. This is a Mud Tools very soft rib. I've also got a handle template. So I'm gonna roll out my handle at the same time. For, to make this size mug, 12 ounces, my template, I'll read you the dimensions, is 10 and 3 quarters inch long by 5 and a half inches tall. And this handle is 5 and 3 quarters inch long one and three quarters inch at the top and a half inch wide at the bottom. Now these are just su suggested sizes. If you, let's say you want to make an eight ounce cup instead, all you would need to do is cut off the top third. So you can see how it e easy it is to alter the size. What I like to use is a very dull knife with a point on it to cut around my template. If you use a needle tool, it tends to leave goobers, so that point is key. And again, I'm not going to forget to cut it a quarter inch bigger along the bottom. This is where you're gonna, your seam for your the bottom of your mug is going to be to attach it. I'm also going to cut out my handle. Make sure, you're gonna set this aside, make sure you wrap it in plastic. We really need it flexible. Now, here's the fun part, ripping it up. Oops, 
I just forgot something. Uh, it's very important to have a smooth rim where your mouth is going to be. So I just get a little bit of water on my finger. Oops, water's over here, not here. <laughs> and we're going to go back to ripping up now keep the order of the pieces that you've ripped up so just rip it and put it right back on your work surface now it's just real easy i've seen some people keep ripping it up and make it smaller and smaller and smaller pieces and then you, it's it becomes harder and harder to put it back together so what do i got i got one two three four five six seven let's not make it more than seven pieces is my suggestion to start and now i'm going to texture all the pieces before i put them back together this is probably one of my all-time favorite clay tools. It's a bamboo wok cleaner from a kitchen store. And one thing that's very important that even I forget to do <laughs> is do not texture the top half inch. Okay, and you'll see why. Now, one thing that I like to do uh, to give it a little added um, interest is I like to use more than one color of clay. And to use more than one color of clay, it's key that they have the same shrinkage with about, within about 1%. Uh, uh, so, and how do you find that out? Everything seems to be online now, but when I started doing this 20 or so years ago, um, everything was in a catalog, um, so I got the Laguna catalog and the uh, all the companies around's catalog, and I found a couple of different clays. I wanted contrasting colors, so this one fires out sort of a cream color, and this is kind of a warm tan color um, that hang together. Um, you can even, if they have a really good shrinkage match, you can even use pieces of the alternate color of clay in your quilt, quilted surface. What I'm using here is uh, Quail Sandstone Buff. And the lighter color of clay that I'm using is called Clay Planet Bravo Buff. Now I fired a cone six in an electric kiln. So if you're gonna do it to cone 10, it, you're gonna to have to find two clays that hang together. Um, if you are even low fire, this works. You know, you might wanna start with one color. I had a hard time at low fire trying to find two different colors that would hang together. If you don't have two different colors of clay, start with one. That's what I did. I like to put like, different buttons of clay and make this look like sort of applique. So what I do, I use my pony roller. This is probably my second favorite all-time tool. It's a quick way to make little slabs. Make this very thin. And now, uh, what stamp am I gonna do? I like to start just, you know, out of habit, I like to put a big stamp right on one side. And I do that while the, uh, the slab is flat. It's just a lot easier to get it attached. You can put little buttons of alternate color on later when it's standing up, it's pretty easy. So what I like to do is rip around the edge because anytime you have that rip 
it will catch the glaze when uh, you start wiping it off and you will see how that works later in the video. Okay, so I've got my little piece of clay. I wanna make sure it fits on here. Nope, a little wide. And I'm going to use this stamp makes a beautiful spiral. All it is, if you can tell, is a thin slab rolled up to make that spiral and pinched at the bottom to make a stamp. And this is bisqued. Likewise, you can use another thin slab and that one made this. So you can see the technique. Now you shouldn't need to add any water because your clay is fresh right out of the bag. So I'm going to put it on, use my pony roller to make sure it's good and stuck. And then push in my stamp. How far is how far do you want to go? You want to go about halfway down. So there's my first one, or my second one. Now, out of habit, I, I use this in my, uh, my design. It's a chop that my father-in-law had made for me when he went to Taiwan on business. And the way, you know, people call me pink. I've signed pots pink forever. And he wanted to get me a chop that said pink but apparently there was no word for pink, so it says light red pottery artist, light red pottery artist, which gives me a giggle, and it makes a great stamp. So I just work that into the design. And again, uh, I didn't do the top half inch where your mouth is going to be. There are about a gazillion ways to make texture tools and the easiest way is to just find them. This is a piece of driftwood and something like wood is not going to stick into the clay. It comes right off. So those are super easy to start with. Another super favorite texture tool. And just to make you drool, here's just only part of them. So once you start collecting texture tools and making texture tools, it becomes like an obsession. But you know, it's it, I'm always finding new ones. These are ham hock bones. I make split pea soup. And so I always ask the butcher to slice the ham hock into several pieces and after you cook you got these wonderful wonderful shapes so i'll use a variety of sizes sometimes all in one piece Okay, that's going to go there. These are really fun. They're rolling pins with uh, ridges cut in them, so they make lines. And if you're a spaz at making things even like I am, just uh, roll it a bunch of times. Now, this last one, I love to use these fabric wood blocks that I've collected over the years. They're from Indonesia. They really were used for uh, fabric printing. Um, so here's a one that I've used. You do have to coat them with cornstarch so that they don't stick and the cornstarch burns out in the firing. If you ever have a texture tool that you know, isn't one of these and you have a hard time getting it to release, cornstarch is the key. 
so I have this fabulous little, you can, uh, forever, I've, I mean forever, I've used just a little container of cornstarch and a paintbrush. And then uh, a friend of mine, a, a great potter, showed me about these li this little thing that cake decorators or bakers use from Wilton. You can look it up online and all you have to do is do that. And alternately, you can just put that on your clay as well and stamp away and nothing sticks. Now with these bigger stamps, I put the slab on top. It's very difficult to get an even stamp with a big stamp if you push straight down from the top. So again, I use my pony roller. Do a little at a time, back and forth. I kind of hung over a little bit, but that'll be in the seam, so I don't really care. And then I want to see whether I have a good impression because if you lift the whole thing off and it's not deep enough, there's just no way you are ever going to reposition it the same. So take a little peek from a corner and see whether it's impressed enough. And so I, I see a little wussy area right here. And again, there's no right or wrong about, you know, whether you get it deep enough, deep enough or not. Um, it's just the, the glaze wipes off more easily if it's got a, a deep texture. Um, I've seen some beautiful pots made with this technique where the glaze wasn't completely wiped off. It was kind of left partially on as a fog and they're just gorgeous. There's just no, no wrong way to do it. Okay, that looks about right. So now I've got everything textured. So I get to put it back together. And, well, I'll show you that later. Um, if you are at all one of those people that is super slow at getting everything textured, you might want to use just a little bit of water. I don't ever use slip. I do use a paintbrush and water, a long handled paintbrush with a stiff tip, and you'll see why. Um, okay, so I start on one side just to keep my bearings so I do get it back together correctly because it is like a puzzle. I'll start at the right hand side, flip it over, line it up with the top and the left side, okay? Then I, I, since I have this straight edge up here, I'm just gonna keep going across from right to left. Now, let's say you're worried that your clay has gotten a little bit stiff, which mine has, uh, because I left the slab out too long. <laughs> so you saw how much water I did. I mean, just super minimal, because you don't wanna lose the freshness of that ripped edge. That's what's gonna catch the glaze as you can see around my ripped edges. Okay, so this one is gonna go here. I, you can see I'm just laying them in position and I am not pressing them at this point. I'm overlapping them about an eighth inch, not a lot, but enough to uh, make a seal when we decide to seal it. If you end up with some extra over here because you ripped rather enthusiastically and stretched it, you can always just cut it off before we stand it up. Now, okay, now I've got this straight line down here. So I'm going to go from left across this way. And, I, and again, if your clay is, you know, really super soft and gushy, you don't need any, uh, I got some grog dragging through making texture I don't like there. Um, you don't need any water at all. 
So what you do want to make sure is you've still got that quarter inch of clay. So I have to shift this around a little bit. So I've got a quarter inch clay across the bottom. Okay, now this piece, because it's got cornstarch on it, I am going to use a scoring tool and lightly score around here, just around that edge, where I'm gonna put something with a lot of cornstarch on it. And I'm definitely gonna put water on that. Not a flood of water, just enough to moisten it. Okay, and now I have got all my puzzle pieces back together. Now, time and time again, I've taught this to a lot of people. Somebody can't get it back together and there's a hole somewhere. Well, that's not a mistake. We call it the gift because then you just get to, you need to make it look intentional. Um, that's the key to a, a really fine looking pot in, in my opinion, is it looks, it's made with intention. So what I would do is I would go over and get a little piece of my alternate color of clay, texture it and put it in that hole. Because by the time you stand the whole thing up, you've got this little surprise to the eye, which makes, which has, is enjoyable by the person drinking the, uh, the liquid in the cup. So that's what my, uh, my suggestion is. Okay, so now we're going to, I just am pressing this together just with my fingers so that it does not move anymore. Then uh, I use this edge of my roller tool and you can see it's key that it's curved so that when you use it to just, I'm lightly rolling it over to finish those seams for good, you're only touching the seam because if you decided to use this side and you're really moving on out to make sure it, it's stuck together, you've just destroyed your texture. So at this point, you've only lost some of the texture at the seams, which you can either live with and think of it as footprints in the sand that are partially washed away when the wave comes in, or you can re-stamp it a bit with uh, when it's standing up. So. I also use this point to see, is there any really thin point? I tend to get it where I've used a big stamp and that's when I reach over to use some soft clay. You really need to use soft clay here so you don't destroy your texture and just, or let's say you have a little hole or something like that. You can just plug it from the back so that it's a little more uh, stable. That looks good to me. And as you can see, it's kind of stuck. It's kind of stuck now to the tar paper, which really makes it easier to stand up. And you can see I've got that quarter inch sticking out from the bottom. Again, if you are one of those exuberant rip and tears, you can just cut the thing a quarter inch so that you have a quarter inch left. I am, these are my two seams. I am going to bevel them so that they fit together nicely. This is re reduces the bulk. And I for sure am going to score because as you've worked, the, the, the clay is dried from the edges in. So for sure, this has become drier than the rest of the pot. So I'm gonna use 
nice deep scoring. Then I can flip the whole thing over and what I'm going to have to do is peel it back a little bit to bevel this side. Now, if, you're, if your uh, template isn't sticking anymore, that's okay too. You're just going to flip it over and lay it on top of the template anyway. Score that. Now this also gives you a chance to say, oh, hmm, that got that got washed out a bit. I think I'll restamp right now while it's while it's still flat. See, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat here. Do it standing up, do it flat, whatever seems to be the easiest for you. And it looks like I ended up with a blank spot there, so I'm just going to go back with another piece, and another side of this uh, piece of driftwood. And I think the rest of that looks pretty good. So I will flip it back onto my template. If your top isn't straight, now's a good time to trim it straight. I also see a thin spot right here, so I am going to, again, stuff some clay in here. Don't worry about all these little nitpicky things you see me do. Um, you, you may not notice it until you get the, top, uh, get the whole thing made. And then, you know, you may not notice it at all. Um, I wanted to show you one of the early mugs I made about 20 years ago, just to make everybody feel better. <laughs> it is not round by any means. It doesn't have a smooth inside by any means. It has a, not a very comfortable handle. The glaze dripped like crazy where I didn't want it to. It ran to the shelf and I ground it down. And this is truly one of my favorite mugs that I have probably dishwashed and microwaved thousands of times. So this is, and, and it almost started coming apart here as it dried. So, you know, don't beat yourself up if your pots don't look like mine. Your pots will end up with your own touch to them and they change over time the more that you make. This one actually only had four pieces of clay. One, two, three, four, I'm sorry, five pieces of clay when I started making them. So it's simpler. And in a way, I keep going back to this mug because I like it better than later ones that got straighter and busier. So that's up to you. I'm going to put some water on my seams. Make sure the water gets into that deeply made scoring. I always say no wimpy scoring. It's important to uh, have deep, deep scoring for a strong seam. And this is critical. I'm going to turn up my quarter of an inch. to make a 90 degree angle. So you can see that, okay. Makes a little shelf like shape down there. I'm feeling the edge and it is just super dry. So I'm just gonna do that a little bit. And I've got everything ready to go. Now comes the super duper favorite tool again, my Takati can with pantyhose on it. This happens to be a very, uh, just the, the right size shape to wrap the pot around to give it its shape. The other thing you're gonna need is a piece of tape to hold that template 
in its shape. So you start by wrapping your clay around it. Don't worry if it doesn't wrap tightly. It's just everybody's is going to be a little bit different. It's easier to get the can out if it doesn't wrap tightly. And you can see the template does, is never going to meet. It's just not. So don't try. What I'm doing here is just getting that seam to stick to each other. You don't have to make sure it's super well joined. Okay, and I want you to notice these sides are parallel. If you have on the bottom, if you have one, one edge that's lower than the other, you're gonna have the leaning tower or coffee cup. So, which I've seen a lot of those. I've made those. Sometimes they're kind of cool. Get my tape on. With this kind of method, it's if you, as soon as you get it standing up, you're a lot safer. It's uh, less likely the whole thing's going to just start falling apart on you. And the can comes right out. And at that point, that's where you can put your hand all the way in. A finger supporting on the inside. Make sure you've got a good seal all the way up to the top. Make sure where your seams are at the top, there's a good join and I wanna show you what I'm gonna fix. You can see that that is asking to come apart. So again, you get that little piece of soft clay. And voila, it is fixed. Now we're going to put the base in. So you got to keep that template on until you get the base in. You can see I'm tapping it and that keeps that bottom part at a nice 90 degrees. What I use to join the, uh, the base to it is a one inch dowel. So I take that flat end and I'm just gently tamping the excess that I turned under. You don't wanna do a whole you know, slam on it. You're just making it thinner so that when you do the join, it's not super bulky. So that's what I've got to cover, okay? I'm gonna take that little goober off. Now you can use if you've got some of your slab left that you rolled out. Um, you can use some of that. I like to make it a little bit thinner so that join right here isn't super thick. So I stretch it by tossing if you have a hard time doing that. You can use this tool, make it a little thinner. And then I'm going to rip around that edge where I'm going to do the join. Now, of course, I've made it a little bit too small. I was going to dazzle you by getting it right the very first time, but no. So I'm going to stick some back on. You can see how rather cavalier <laughs> you can be about slapping some clay together to make a better slab. Now, 
here we go. I don't want it to go all the way to the edge. I want it to go just so that there's enough to make a join, but not all the way to the edge because I don't want to see the seam. I want it to be like a tablecloth that just when it comes to the edge of the table, it goes right over and the pattern isn't interrupted. So you can see the join here. Okay, again. Scoring. And believe you me, that edge has dried out. I can feel it. Now I'm just gonna place this on top so and, and get it to a point where it's just sticking. But again, it's not suitably joined. So that we, this way I get to turn it right over. Again, take my dowel. And gently tap. One more time do this take a look at the bottom see if it's completely joined so it's sticking up a little bit there and now you know you can see the join in the bottom it doesn't look too you know, easy to clean and uh, the way most people want to see the nice clean bottom of a mug before they pour coffee into it. So this is where you get your nice long handled stiff brush and it acts as a finger down there. You can't get your finger down there to smooth it out. And you can make that seam just disappear. And there's no need to put a coil in there. Some people operate with, with slab building by putting coils in the corners of joins. No need to do that. Okay, now the unveiling. To me, that's the back side, and then here's the other side. Okay, I can see that this seems sticking out a little, so I'm gonna go back there, make sure it's joined all the way up. You can even use your little roller. And yes, you've lost some texture here, but this is where I'm gonna put my handle. You're not gonna see it, so. I'll show you closer. That's just not all that attractive. So let's make our handle. Which I made before, so it's nice and flexible. Now I want a handle that's comfortable. I want it to have some volume in it so that it's like a pulled handle. It's got the feeling of a pulled handle. Um, so I don't, I don't do it as a plain, just as a plain slab. Um, otherwise it feels like a ruler. So I take this piece and I take my one inch dowel again 
and I start making it thinner because I'm gonna roll it into a tube so that it has volume. I make it a little bit longer and and go back and make it a little bit wider. And by virtue of making this super thin, you're condensing those clay molecules. It makes it extra flexible so that you can roll it into a tube. So this is what I've got now. I'm going to take the top edge and roll it towards myself. So you can see what I've got. And I take the bottom edge and roll it over. It's not really sealed yet. And you can just run your finger down to make sure it's closed. Okay, now there is going to be somebody that's going to ask the question, isn't that going to blow up because it contains air? The answer is no. When, when you're bisking this, we're all bisking them slow enough so that the clay, the, the air goes out of the pores of the clay. Um, those, those pores of clay don't actually close until it becomes vitrified and no, nothing can go in or out anymore. Um, and we're, we're, if you bisked really quickly, you'd probably blow it off, but most people don't. So um, I, I promise you, I've never ever blown a handle off. It's not air that makes things blow up, it's trapped moisture. So as long as your, plate, uh, your pots are dry and you follow the directions for a generally slow bisque, you are good. Now when I make a big handle, let's say I'm making a really tall pitcher, sometimes I have to stuff a little carrot of clay inside to, uh, so that the handle doesn't flatten out on me. And at that point, because I've got clay in there as well, it takes a long time for it to dry and I'll make a little pinhole on the inside of the handle where my hand will not hit it. Okay, back to this handle. I am turning it on its side. Make sure I've got a handle that starts thicker at the top and gets narrower like a pulled handle would. So I'm making a handle big enough for four fingers. This is a heavy, a big mug, 12 ounces. So I want all four fingers to get in there. If you've got a smaller pot, like a cup, you're not gonna get all four in there. You're gonna get maybe two. So you adjust the size of your handle based on the size of your pot. For a, 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 a handle to feel good, you want to get, you see how my hand is close to the middle of the pot so it feels balanced. That's what you're going for. Uh, there's a tendency for some people when they make handles is to bring them up over the top because it looks, looks interesting, but it puts your hand up here and everything's unbalanced. You can't turn them upside down in a cupboard, etc. So this is what I've got now. Looks kind of like a question mark. I'm going to put it over my seam. So I'm going to bevel this here. Make sure this is thin enough that I can press it on easily. 
Now I'm going to go ahead and score this and I'll turn it around so you can see. The way the handle joins is this end joins like that. So I am actually scoring about an inch down from the top. And then uh, the, the, the tail I join almost right down to the bottom. So you can see my nice messy scoring, okay? No wimpy scoring. Water. Okay, you're going to put fingers on the inside. Let's see if you can see this better. Thumb inside the curve, pressing them together. And then get all, I tend to get all the way down so I can look through the, look through my handle. I've got it not 100% joined. It's on there, sticking on there pretty well. Looks like it's lined up and I finished that push. So it is stuck. The last thing I do is I look through that negative space. Are all four fingers going to fit in there? Maybe not necessarily. So I'm going to pull that last small part out. Get all four fingers in there. And there you have it. Next, I'm going to show you how to glaze these. And now we're going to move on to glazing this pot. Uh, in actuality, it looks mysterious, but it is the quickest part of making it. So you'll notice I've got some little red places and this is just created using an over-the-counter cone six glaze this is called deep fire brick made by amico so ahead of time i have picked what areas i want to have red so i want the spiral to be red so i literally just blob that glaze right in there until it fills the indentation and now after I get it all gooped in there I'm gonna let it dry I think I'll make that little dot red too a couple little red dots you can see you don't have to be all that careful at this point, which is a total relief, not having to be careful in my book. Okay, so then over here, I have already let it dry. I wanted this to remain red. Okay, and here's the super mysterious quick way to keep the glaze in there, damp sponge. Start wiping it off. Keep moving the sponge around so you get a clean spot each time you do that. And there you go. It has now remained in that texture. The last thing I'm going to do is I have put my glaze on, I've wiped it off, and I put wax resist over the area that I want to remain red. Here we are for the next step. You'll see that the wax resist has completely dried. 
over the little areas where I want the glaze to stay red. I am using a black glaze that I've mixed up. I like the black because it's a nice contrast. Really, any dark glaze will work for this, your choice. So I've got it all mixed up. And now here's the, the really, really easy part. You just dunk it. I always take a look all the way around to make sure I've got the glaze all the way in the texture. Sometimes it's a little um, recalcitrant, doesn't want to go in all the deep texture. So that's when I'll just basically rub, rub it in where it doesn't want to go all the way in. And now we're going to let this part dry. Finally, we're at the last step. So here's an important thing to note before I start wiping off the black glaze is that I have put wax resist over the top half inch of the lip. And that's to give me a nice tight line, like right here, so that when you put your lip on the top, it feels good. You don't want your lip on uh, raw clay and it's very hard to just wipe a straight line so I put wax resist over it. So I start with a sponge that's got a straight edge and you'll see why. And uh, I start by putting one hand inside carefully. I always start at the bottom so I don't forget. And keep wringing out your sponge. Now you'll see a little bit of glaze will still stay in those seams. That's not enough to cause an issue with it uh, fusing to your shell. Now I want the handle to stay glazed, so I'm gonna use that straight edge on my sponge and I'll just start to wipe up and down on the outside of that handle. I can seem to wipe a straight line on the outside of the handle, but I can't seem to do it around the rim. So you're about to see why the wax resist is important because you get up there and then the sponge doesn't wipe it off. So I turn my sponge this way and the glaze stays on there. Continue to just keep wringing out my sponge and you can see the beauty of the texture emerge. And the rest is just wiping. The last thing I do, because you know your sponge is picking up quite a bit of glaze after a while. So I'll go over to the sink and I'll rinse this off so it's totally clean. and do one final wipe off all the way around with that totally clean sponge. And there you have it, all set to go into the kiln. Thank you. So there was <laughs> one question. There was one question that came through. If you could give us a little bit more information about your Wilton cake tool for the cornstarch. Oh, uh, you already found it quickly at Michael's. Um, what other info can I give you about it? Just other than you can just you fill it with cornstarch and you can either just dab it all over the slab or you can dab it all over the tool. So that's that's really all there is to it. Does it have a name? Oh, let me of just. Of course, see. there's no name on it. <laughs> it just looks like this. I think if you just, um, I think it's really for um, uh, what, powdered sugar. It's a sifter. It's, it's a sifter. I'm sorry. A it's sifter. a sifter. Okay. Yeah, I didn't have a real hard time finding it when I just Googled uh, Wilton 
So you should be able to find it under sifter or uh, powdered sugar duster sort of thing. All right, other questions out there? Oh, glaze mixing paddle? No, I happen to have this very old, old, old restaurant supply place near my house where I bought those paddles a long time ago. Oh, look at that mug. Look at that mug there. <laughs> years old. Nice. Nice. How does it bring back memories? <laughs> yeah. The script's quiet. Put a question in the chat that's above the, um, the one about the paddle, if you look at the chat. You have a way of saving the glaze that you wiped off? Maybe you know, I, I have had people worry about how much glaze that they're washing away. So I finally just um, did an entire electric kiln load with wiping everything over a bowl so that I could see how much glaze was left in the bottom of that bowl to see what, you know, what it felt like I was throwing away. And it was so little. <laughs> I just stopped worrying about it. But if you're one of those people that can't bear getting rid of one molecule of glaze, you just, I, I just used a big, a great big bowl to do 90% of the wiping you know, as long as you're just doing one glaze and then walked over to the sink and got a clean sponge for the final glaze. And then you just have to spend the time pouring the water off and uh, putting the, 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 the leftover sludge back in your bucket. And it's like, life's too short, man. <laughs> I just decided to let that one go. Um, can I make a comment? Sure. I just want to say I, I like the uh, pantyhose idea. That's really great because I've used like plastic wraps around different forms. And that, <laughs> I went, oh, that kind of did a light. But I also wanted to mention that I noticed a lot of people use like ribs and things where they're smoothing out their slabs. But yeah. what, what I really, really love is just those little miniature car windshield wiper blades. They just go voop, voop over a big slab. And that works really great too if you're not doing the big piece, if you're doing bigger pieces. But That's but thank, a good, su good suggestion. Thanks for the idea. That 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 will do me save me some issues. <laughs> really nice work. Thank you. So somebody here is marketing uh, uh, pieces of a roll of uh, uh, roofing paper. Who is that? But I'm not sure. Are you asking me a question? No, I'm, I'm saying oh. someone's posted on the chat. Does anyone want to buy some of the roll of 15 pound roof paper? Let's try to figure out who's who's pitching that idea. Rebecca? No? Rebecca wants some. All right. I don't know who that person is. Okay. Well, whoever they are, it's, they're signed into the Potter's Guild account. So that's... It's them. Brenda. Yeah, it must be Brenda. Okay. And I think she's wanting to go in together to buy one. I don't know that she has one that she's trying to sell. Right. But I actually have a huge role. <laughs> I just don't know if it's 15 pounds or 30. I think you, I'm, I'm going to try to use it. See if it works. Can you fold it? Like, and get a crease? Yeah. Uh, might be the 30 then. I'll see. I'll check it out. Yeah. You have to be able to fold it and get a crease. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Bummer. Right. It doesn't fit. <laughs> yeah, because I got a little, I got a small piece of the 30 and it's way too heavy. It doesn't work. Uh, so the 15 is better. And I see it, but I go, I can't buy that big roll. <laughs> it's just like, what am I going to do with that big roll? Yeah. I bought it used at Restore. So it's actually only uh, half a roll and that's still like two lifetimes. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, geez. Can I, I, somebody said to go to a site that they're doing roofing and ask them for some. Yeah. Oh, geez. Hi, uh, Stacy. 
Mm -hmm. I will, uh, I'll wait to hear from you, but I've got <laughs> Rebecca, Luann, and Nadia that want to buy in. So that's four people that will buy into your uh, role if it's 15. All right, I'll check it out. And you would make Daniel so happy if I get rid of most of that role. <laughs> you keep moving it around the garage. <laughs> I'll take a square yeah. too. Okay, I'll let you know. All right. Any questions for Elaine? I just want to say that I think the reason we don't have so many questions is Elaine is one of the best teachers I've ever heard. Yeah. That was really great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. Very, very thorough. <laughs> yeah, the, te the technique has a lot, there's lots and lots of details. And so I've made it and taught it so many times, you guys, I have to thank you for getting me to finally video every freaking detail because I feel I feel happy that it's all I can just show it to somebody now <laughs> instead of trying to explain it. <laughs> for people who don't like the feel of raw clay on the mugs, have you ever tried just covering it with clear once you're done with all your wiping? And do you have yes. a pro or con on that? Well, here's the thing you need to, let's say you're putting all that glaze into the texture and then you wanna dip the whole thing into clear. Just keep in mind that glaze on glaze makes things run, okay? So um, I, to be honest, I've done that at low fire uh, where I didn't like the feel of low fire clay. And so I put a glaze into the texture and then I dumped the whole thing in clear and it, it worked just fine. It's just, that's my little caveat to people is um, th two layers of glaze, two different kinds is going to make it probably run a little bit. So just, you just have to be a little more wary of that, but it should work. Okay. Do you use <coughs> underglaze instead? I have never used underglaze. Uh, it's not that you can't. It's mm -hmm. just, I wanted... Like I wanted a, a shinier glaze, the feel of the glaze on the handle, the feel of glaze on the interior. So why not make the outside match, you know? I was just and, thinking if you wanted to cover the whole thing in clear, instead of using a black glaze, use a black underglaze and then cover it in clear and it won't run. That is perfect. So we're waiting. Okay, who's going to do it? <laughs> I did notice you use the Amico glazes. Now they have a Celadon versions of black and red and things like that that I don't run. Uh, they're pretty stable, so they might be able. You might be able to double up on those and not have them running, like a sure. with the black. Sure. Even the Snapdragon or something for the red. So, so we have a question. How does this technique scale? Have you made larger pots this way? Any unique problems as it scales? Okay, so I think, let's see how to say the, what is it? The biggest thing I've made is, what is that? Two feet tall, two feet tall. Um, the thing about scaling is the bigger you go, the thicker the slab you have to make. That's really the only difference. Um, quarter inch is not going to fly. <laughs> I, I pretty much tell my students, Let's say about this big is quarter inch, about this big is five sixteenths, about this big. <laughs> and you can, you can't, you just add a sixteenth of thickness for every, I don't know, I call something large, like a bit, a really tall pitcher that's two feet tall. I, I'm going to make it at least five sixteenths to three eighths inch. Mm. And if you're working with, you know, I work. I always work with clay that has grog. I am not. I am not as talented as those pers uh, porcelain kind of people. So you know, you can either switch to a groggy or clay if you're having cracking problems, or you can try making the slab just a little bit thicker. Okay, we've got we've got another question. Applying wax on the top of glaze at the rim of the cup after dipping it in the glaze bucket. The glaze has to be dry to do that, right? Absolutely. Yes. I saw something pop up about 
tinted something? Did I miss a question? Yeah. Have you tinted the main clay with colors and added them into the design? Mm -hmm. Hang on. I was thinking the same thing. I just bought a whole bunch of, of stains. <laughs> So I know this is I know this is hard to see, and I um, I worked with colored clay a lot for a while. Um, I made black clay and blue clay and pink clay and lavender clay. Oh, there we go. Um, this is really dinky because I entered in this um, miniatures show, and there's a it's a whole tea set. I, the teapot is not here so I can't wave it at you but yes stained clay with this technique just is really cool <laughs> does that answer your question Trudy did that answer your question um she's showing something with a very dark clay body so I was thinking more in terms of something with a light clay body where the contrast like if you did a spiral and then added that in so it showed more of a design okay I don't, I don't get what you're saying so the, the piece you're showing right now is very dark but the one you did with the demo so uh -huh. instead, of, instead of like doing a, a red tint in the spiral what if you did a red tinted clay and, and press that in oh yeah yeah, no, the only reason I, this looks dark is I've added mason stain to make it black clay. So wow. if you've got a mason stain that you can add to your cream or white colored clay, then you, you're, 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 you're all set. You're doing the same thing I did. Make sense? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, in a sense, that solves your problem of finding two clays that will shrink at the same rate because all I did, I was just using white clay and I made a bunch of different colors using mason stain. And they, of course, are always going to shrink the same rate because they're the same clay. Now, when you use the tint and you tore it apart, did you put the tint, tinted clay together and tore them and tear the, the clay then? Exactly when did you tear the clay? Before or after you tinted the the oh, clay. no, you tint, you tint the clay before. And you put it, and then you tear it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Tinting clay is a whole nother workshop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, sure you can find, I'm sure you can find something online about um, adding mason stain. Yes, I'm just adding, I'm just starting to do that, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's great fun. I spent years playing with that, so. All right, any other questions out there? Last call. Yeah, why not just wax the bottom and not have to worry about it? Oh, you can, you can. I'm just lazy. I hate wax resist. I loathe it. <laughs> so what I do now is, um, yeah, I, I just hate waxing stuff. I hate it. So. If you want to wax the bottom, feel free. In my book, if I can see, if I see, here's, here's the mug that I was making in the demo. If I get to see that glaze in that seam, yippee yahoo, that makes me happy every time I see it. That I got away with having glaze in all the seams in this pot. So that's the main reason. But um, if, if it feels really funny to you to not wax, Go ahead and wax. The other thing I do, if I'm doing a whole bunch of mugs and I just dunked them, I'll take my metal rib and I'll go over the bucket and I'll just <laughs> and, and get that powder right back into the bucket for the bases. And for me, that's quicker than having to wax. So I have a question. Yeah. Do you still wear your clothes inside out so you see the seams? <laughs> Of course I do. I remember that from the 
<laughs> the workshop. But I, I have to tell you that over the years, I've taken this technique. I don't have a good sample here, but I make these bowls that I do a ripped up technique that I use a mold and then I rip up and I do a lots of different textures in, a, in bowl shapes. Oh, and cool. It, and it was definitely inspired by your work. So kudos. Yay. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> So we got, you gave us many new ideas and I especially like the way you finished the bottom. This was very well done and a clear presentation. Thank you. Oh, yay. All right, then. We've got a lot of thank yous coming in. So I want to, on behalf of the Guild and, you know, everybody that's joined us tonight, I want to thank you for taking the time to be such a wonderful presenter, getting on this right away, getting stuff to me in a timely fashion and doing a great job. You know, we, we've we loved it. And clearly um, your demo was excellently put together for us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, right. if my, my only last request is just so if you guys don't mind being on my mailing list, for when I teach workshops and stuff like that. Um, I'd appreciate it. And if you don't want to be, that's fine too. So tell you what, I've got your, you know, you've got my email address. When you've got something coming up, I'll make sure that our person who sends out the newsletter gets whatever you send me in our monthly newsletter. Sounds good. All right, excellent. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. And Elaine, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.